statues come down, it happens all around the world. You're changing history, you're changing culture. You're changing history, you're changing culture. Where does it stop? We can't change history, we can't rewrite history. But some say history isn't set in stone. That's very one-sided, you can't erase histories. Only uh, settler people, like, you know, only the colonists can erase history. You can rewrite history. We've got a great example right here, the statue of Edward Cornwallis. It's uh, a sanitized version of history, the history I grew up reading. Longer than I've been alive, people have been trying to tear that down. The statue as it is, is an impediment to progress. It represents the, uh, a monument to white supremacist thinking. Like with Cornwallis, it's not just removing the statue, it's also the reckoning that that includes around colonial violence. It's this dismissiveness, it doesn't exist. Racism doesn't exist in Canada. But decades of debate over history can lead to historic moments. Here it is, finally, reconciliation in action. Cornwallis is just one of many historical figures at the center of controversy over commemoration. When the view of colonial history shifts, the truth can be ugly. It's important that we decolonize our history because the history that we did grow up learning, that um, I was taught was a, a colonial history. The Mi'kma have been here since time immemorial, but a typical timeline for the history of Nova Scotia only starts when settlers arrive. Well, that's just a significant amount of history that we're neglecting to understand and then to account for. The country didn't start in 1604. Look around Halifax today and you'll find a city steeped in its history as a British fortress. The noon gun still goes off every day. So where's our history if you can't erase history? All these street signs, they're still names of colonizers. Mi'kmaq activist Rebecca Moore grew up here. Everything that I see reflected in myself in this city is um, it's very rooted in like the ground, in, in like the, the land itself. It's nothing in this, um, you know, like concrete jungle. I don't see myself reflected in it. Moore traces her ancestry back seven generations to Mi'kmaq leader Jean-Baptiste Cope, who signed the Peace and Friendship Treaty in 1752. Where's his commemoration? He was an honorable person. Where, where is any mention of him in anywhere? The only thing I see, he has this t his name on this tiny little plaque in the, in the new library in Halifax, and that's it. It's just a tiny little plaque mention, and he's quite significant in Nova Scotian history, actually Canadian, overall Canadian history, and um, that's all he got. And he is so much more significant than that. Contrast that with Edward Cornwallis, celebrated as the founder of Halifax. You know, he didn't find it. We, we were there all the time. So, Courtney, correct, this is the unceded traditional territory. The struggle between Mi'kmaq and settler versions of history is crystallized in the controversy over Cornwallis. He did do horrible things. He did do one good thing, which would be settling Halifax, uh, where we all are now, or unceded Mi'kmaq territory, depending on which side you're on. You know it's unceded Mi'kmaq territory, no matter what side you're on? In July of 2017, hundreds showed up to a Halifax rally, hoping to see the statue removed. It's like, um, on a smaller scale, maybe a Hitler statue being in a, a Jewish community. To the Mi'kmaq, Cornwallis is kind of a villain, and they aren't the only ones in history to say so. As a human being, he's a difficult person for anyone to rally behind. Cornwallis was court-martialed when British ships fled the French in battle in 1756. His superior was executed. 
Cornwallis lived but was lampooned in British political cartoons. Him being shamed and mocked in the streets and burned in effigy and called a coward for, for not attacking. So it's hard to take him from a British point of view. If you're Scottish, Cornwallis ran a brutal campaign against an uprising in the Highlands. Cornwallis, if he saw the bagpiper, he would have shot him dead. I mean, that was illegal in his day. It was treason. And if you're Mi'kmaq author Dan Paul, he made it clear that he thought it would be best to root the Mi'kmaq out of Nova Scotia, uh, Peninsula Nova Scotia, uh, for all time and forever. But in 1931, the city of Halifax decided they needed a hero, all part of a tourism drive by CN Rail. The statue of Cornwallis was erected to celebrate British sovereignty, the dawning of a great era. What wasn't making headlines? The Nova Scotia 1931, there was a home for colored children, there was the Indian Residential School, the blacks and uh, the Mi'kmaq were barred from most institutions in, uh, in the province. Nova Scotia was uh, <laughs> called by many of us the Mississippi of Canada. Paul says the Mi'kmaq account of history was missing from bookshelves. Yeah, actually, there wasn't too many uh, books written by indigenous people in the Americas. He wanted to change the narrative, so in 1993, Paul wrote, We Were Not the Savages. This is your history, okay? I, I'm using your documents, your histori historical documents. Go down to the archives. Everything I have in my book, you can find at the archives. In letters to the British Lords of Trade, Cornwallis wrote he wanted to destroy the savages, commonly called Micmacs, wherever they are found, to root them out entirely. This was a contested landscape. He's sailing into three different worlds at once. To Cornwallis, it's Nova Scotia. To the French, it is uh, New France. To Mi'kmaq people, it's still Mi'kma'ki. It's still held physically by them and is still seen conceptually by them as their homeland. The British were invading and stealing Mi'kmaq territory. The Mi'kmaq were uh, people who had occupied this uh, area of North America. They had a culture they were defending. The story unfolds in the minutes of the Executive Council for Halifax, governed by Ed Cornwallis. He met with the St. John's Indians to talk about a peace treaty signed in 1726. But Cornwallis feared Indians were assembled to attack. He issued a bounty offering 10 guineas for every Indian taken or destroyed, an effort to quell the Mi'kmaq resistance. So this is where the early fort would have been, Fort Sackville, and you can see why they put it here. It's got a view straight to Halifax, easy communication with the, the city there. It's guarding the river here, which was the main waterway for the Mi'kmaq. They established the fortress here, discouraged Mi'kmaq people, chased them away from this area. A lot of people were killed as they established the fort here. A little-known historical site not far from Halifax is where bounty hunter John Gorham and his rangers were based. A nearby street still bears his name. A private mercenary force, uh, an independent security force, you could see them as the rangers. Uh, they could provide security for, for areas or they would go out into the woods and attack people to, to claim these scalping, pro these scalping bounties. I want people to know that he committed genocide against our people. He wanted us wiped out. I'm really proud to still be here um, because if he had his way, I wouldn't even be here. For me, it's important not just to have the statue come down if that's the final result, but to have people understand why it comes down. In the spring of 2017, Halifax City Council voted to form a committee to look at concerns over commemoration. This motion is not about rewriting history. And the debate that has polarized opinion in Halifax continued. What bothers me on this, I received a number of emails that are out and out racist. Now moving statutes or hiding them away somewhere, I don't think it's a fair and appropriate thing to do. We can't whitewash history, we just can't discolor it. Now it's time to make a decision. In a radio interview last summer, Hensby called Indigenous activists hotheads on the warpath. 
He apologized, but in a later email, typed out, peace pipe, anyone? Perhaps it might have been, it seemed to be insensitive by some, but uh, the issue was, is I think we all need to look at this in cooler heads, and hopefully our, our committee, that what we do finally get established, will look at all aspects of that. So Indigenous people are hysterical when you address history, but white people are just being objective and reasonable when they defend their history of violence. Right? I just want to see the facts come out, uh, and the real facts, not alternative facts, not emotions, not opinions, not misrepresentations, but the truth. When we come back, the fate of Edward Cornwallis. The truth is that we're the ones with the real jurisdiction here. So if you want the facts and you don't want any emotions in it, there you go. Reconciliation and the racist backlash when colonial history is questioned. Unfortunately, there are people out there who just, who just hate us, who just hate Indigenous people for whatever reason, I don't know. So my crime is pro protesting with Indigenous women. That for me is such an odd concept, is for like very privileged white folks to be like, you should be instilling pride instead of telling us about how much genocide happened on this land. Edward Cornwallis, celebrated as the founder of Halifax, but the Mi'kmaq, a British colonizer intent on genocide. Rebecca Moore went to this junior high back when it was named after Cornwallis. When I attended this school um, under the Cornwallis name and everybody was wearing their Cornwallis hoodies and it would be a sea full of his name on it like people's chests. In 2012 the school was renamed to Halifax Central and this morning it's clear even more has changed. It is my great honor to be the first to welcome you all formally to Mi'kmaq territory, the unceded traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people. The students will now start every day with this land acknowledgement. Progress makes me feel proud. Education is a very powerful tool and we need to stop celebrating these people who committed atrocities against an entire nation that's still here. In the mid-1700s, Cornwallis issued two bounties on Mi'kmaq scalps, women and children included. As for the argument that this was acceptable in a time of war... It's bullshit, <laughs> okay, and it's a white supremacist argument, in my opinion. In 1756, Governor Charles Lawrence issued another bounty. It's often said it's still on the books, though the Canadian government says it's no longer in effect. I can tell you one thing is not forgotten. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and the big man, I don't intend to forget it. <laughs> For three decades, Paul has fought to undo the commemoration of Cornwallis. Last year, Halifax Council struck a committee to look at the pros and cons. One of the big goals, an understanding of history, even one that's uncomfortable. This is a city, like many cities, that has been a victim of systemic racism not just against First Nations, but against African uh, Nova Scotians uh, as well. Um, and we can't deny the history. We have to accept the history and learn from it. But months later, no committee, no action. That statue is still standing, I believe, because of white supremacy. The Cornwallis controversy is echoed across the continent as North America tackles a racist past and present. In the U.S., Civil War heroes like Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee now face scrutiny as slave owners. There is a difference, you see, between remembrance of history and the reverence of it. So for those self-appointed defenders of history and the monuments, they are eerily silent on what amounts to historical malfeasance, a lie by omission. But as monuments come down, racism ramps up. The Klan is protesting the city's decision. Carrying torches, marching through Charlottesville. Protests capped with a shocking attack on August the 12th. I think there's blame on both sides. This week it's Robert E. Lee, 
I notice that Stonewall Jackson's coming down. I wonder, is it George Washington next week? And is it Thomas Jefferson the week after? You know, you, all, you really do have to ask yourself, where does it stop? I don't think it's a question of, you know, where does it stop? Because the reality is it stops till we've accounted it. We are here on land that is still unceded, on land where women's scalps were bleeding. L. Jones is a poet, professor, prominent activist, and indigenous ally. She's noticed a rise in overt racism very much an increase in the intensity of harassment, the kind of violence of that harassment. So, you know, people who love me, I like, don't walk home alone. Jones says racism and rhetoric intensify around Cornwallis. I always call it white amnesia. Like, white people don't have to reckon with history and they have the privilege to forget it. Canada is reckoning with the ugly history of residential schools and the question, should its architects be honored? Duncan Campbell Scott, Hector Langevin, Sir John A. Macdonald, the first Prime Minister of Canada who said, if the child lives with its parents who are savages, he is surrounded by savages. And the list keeps going. In Prince Edward Island, a National Historic Site still bears the name of Geoffrey Amherst. In the 1760s, the British general wanted to spread smallpox to Indigenous people by handing out infected blankets. So he was as far as I'm concerned, a tyrant and a genocidal murderer. John Joe Sark has advocated for a name change for years. Parks Canada is keeping the name Fort Amherst, but Sark is optimistic. I think people are starting to realize that there's more to history than, than what's being printed in the books. It's a challenge now to our youth to go out there and, and, and expose the real history that's there. The Mi'kmaq resistance has fresh new faces. I don't want any of our future generations to grow up in a world with so much ugliness and hate. Yeah, my name is uh, Rebecca Moore. I'm a and the grassroots got a surprise boost at the end of January. Mi'kmaq chiefs issued an ultimatum to City Council. We need to see action now. And that's why we voted for the statue to be immediately removed. Moore and others planned another rally at the statue, and within days, the Cornwallis debate was back before council. You know, this city isn't called Cornwallis. This city is called Halifax. Reconciliation begins with reconciliation. All the statue contributes to our community right now is a flashpoint for division. That's it. That was clear on Canada 150, the ultimate commemoration. And that wasn't a happy celebration for everybody. Uh, especially Indigenous people, and you know, not everybody wanted to celebrate it. I'm not here for Cornwallis. Women held a ceremony to mourn Indigenous loss. Murdered and missing Indigenous women, suicide, yeah, the scalping proclamations. And then we had the Proud Boys show up, and they were there to pay their respects to Cornwallis and the Queen. This is now Canada. It is Mi'kmaq. This is Halifax, well, Nova Scotia. What is so threatening about Indigenous women being in peaceful ceremony? The five Proud Boys, members of the Canadian military, were suspended. What is clearly now, as I learn more about them, a white supremacy group, which we are fundamentally stand opposed to any other values. But after an investigation, the Proud Boys were back on duty, no charges. Masuma Khan sparked fury over Canada 150 when she put forward a motion to Dalhousie University's student council. Basically a motion that recognized um, the celebration of Canada Day and Canada 150 as ongoing colonialism. Who is ironically an immigrant herself. What followed was a barrage of racist threats on social media. Go back home, go to Pakistan, go to Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, tell me how to mutilate myself, tell me how they wish I was dead. Khan, who for the record was born in Nova Scotia, responded on Facebook with the hashtags white fragility can kiss my ass and your tears aren't sacred, this land is. Dalhousie threatened Khan with disciplinary action. But when I get hate and death threats and rape threats and these kinds of violence, there's actually no way to persecute that. That's how messed up our system is. No one from the university made themselves available for an interview. But action is happening at City Hall, and Rebecca Moore is racing in to catch it. This isn't about changing or rewriting history. Cornwallis will always be in the history books. On the floor, a motion to remove the Cornwallis statue and put it in storage. 
but we should not be putting the statue away. We should not be hiding our history. As a white man, I don't know what it feels to walk by that statue and look at it. I don't know. So I uh, am now in support of uh, removing the statue. Okay, thank you, colleagues. That motion has passed. Thank you for voting. It happened really fast that I was kind of like, wait, wait, it passed? And I was like, because we've been resisting this for forever, like my whole life. It was pretty surreal. Uh, yeah, it's down, and it allows us to have the conversation that I think we need to have on true reconciliation. And by the next day, crews are on site. This is showing everybody that violence against Indigenous people is not okay. For that eagle to to come and fly right over us, um, just as just right the same moment as Cornwallis just got removed from his pedestal, it was very affirming to me. A celebratory moment for the Mi'kmaq, and in a history decolonized, they're the ones who count. There was a longer history here in this country. And it's a legitimate history and has to be accepted, has to be acknowledged. I look at the history that counts, and that's my history, one that's rooted in the landscape for 13,500 years. There was nothing prehistoric about it. The knowledge is incredible. I don't look at my history through the lens of some gentleman that was here in 1749 and left. Scotia is out now, let's uh, move on and begin to build a future together. This generation is more empowered than ever. Our children will be even more so and more educated. We're still here and I'm very proud and we're not going anywhere and I just look forward to uh, future assertion endeavors. Mm -hmm.